Hello, and welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast, the podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. My name is Teddy, and I'm going to read a story from an old book. Not one that is particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's readings come from a book published in 1895. The book is called Winning His Spurs, A Tale of the Crusades by G. A. Henty. If you enjoy the book and the reading, please leave a comment and rating in your podcast app. It's very helpful and allows me to put out more episodes. Meanwhile, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the reading. Winning His Spurs A Tale of the Crusades by G. A. Henty, 1895 Chapter 1 the Outlaws. It was a bright morning in the month of August when a lad of some fifteen years of age, sitting on a low wall, watched party after party of armed men riding up to the castle of the Earl of Evesham. A casual observer glancing at his curly hair and bright open face, as also at the fashion of his dress, would at once have assigned to him a purely Saxon origin, but a keener eye would have detected signs that Norman blood ran also in his veins, for his figure was lighter and lighter his features more straightly and shapely cut than was common among Saxons. His dress consisted of a tight-fitting jerkin descending nearly to his knees. The material was a light blue cloth, while over his shoulder hung a short cloak of a darker hue. His cap was of Saxon fashion and he wore on one side a little plume of a heron. In a somewhat costly belt hung a light short sword while across his knees lay a crossbow. In itself almost a sure sign of its bearer being of other than Saxon blood. The boy looked anxiously as party after party rode past towards the castle. I would give something, he said, to know what wind blows these knaves here. From every petty castle in the Earl's foe, the retainers seem hurrying here. Is he bent, I wonder, on settling once and for all his quarrels with the baton of Wortham? Or can he be intending to make a clear sweep of the woods? Ah, here comes my gossip, Hubert. He may tell me the meaning of this gathering. Leaping to his feet, The speaker started at a brisk walk to meet a jovial-looking personage coming down from the direction of the castle. The newcomer was dressed in the attire of a falconer and two dogs followed at his heels. Ah, Master Cuthbert, he said, What brings you so near to the castle? It is not often 
that you favour us with your presence. I am happier in the woods, as you well know, and was on my way thither, but now, when I paused at the sight of all these troopers flocking into Evesham, what enterprise has Sir Walter on hand now, think you? The Earl keeps his own counsel, said the falconer, but methinks a shrewd guess might be made at the purport of the gathering. It was but three days since that his foresters were beaten back by the landless men whom they caught in the very act of cutting up a fat buck. As thou knowest, my lord, though easy and well disposed to all, and not fond of harassing and driving the people, as are many of his neighbours, is yet to the full of fanatical anent in his forest privileges as the worst of them all. They tell me that when the news came in of the poor figure that his foresters cut with broken bows and draggled plumes, for the varlets had soused them in a pond of not so savoury water, he swore a great oath that he would clear the forest of the bands. It may be, indeed, that this gathering is for the purpose of falling in force upon that evil disposed and most treacherous baron, Sir John of Wartham, who has already begun to harry some of the outlying lands and has driven off, I hear, many heeds of cattle. It is a quarrel which will have to be fought out sooner or later, and the sooner the better, I say. Although I am no man of war, and love looking after my falcons, or giving food to my dogs far more, than exchanging hard blows, yet would I gladly don the buff and steel to coat and aid in levelling the keep of the robber and tyrant, Sir John of Wartham. Thanks, good Hubert, said the lad. I must not stand gossiping here. The news you have told me, as you know, touches me closely, for I would not that harm should come to the forest men. Let it not out, I beseech thee, Cuthbert, that the news came from me, for temperate as Sir Walter is at most times, he would, methinks, give me short shift did he know that the wagging of my tongue might have given warning through which the outlaws of the chase should slip through his fingers. Fear not, Hubert, I can be mum when the occasion needs. Can you tell me, Father, when the bands now gathering are likely to set forth? In brief breathing space, the falconer replied, those who first arrived, I left swilling beer and devouring pies and other provisions cooked for them last night. And from what I hear, they will set forth as soon as the last comer has arrived. Whichever be their quarry, they will try to fall upon it before the news of their arrival is brooded abroad. With a wave of his hand to the falconer, the boy started. 
leaving the road and striking across the slightly undulated country dotted here and there by groups of trees. The lad ran at a brisk trot without stopping to halt or breathe until after half an hour's run he arrived at the entrance of the building whose aspect proclaimed it to be the abode of a Saxon Franklin of some importance. It would not be called a castle, but was rather a fortified house with a few windows looking without and surrounded by a moat with a cross drawbridge and capable of sustaining anything short of a real attack. Erstwood had but lately passed into Norman hands and was indeed at present owned by a Saxon. Sir William de Lance, the father of the lad who is now entering its portals, was a friend and follower of the Earl of Evesham and soon after his lord had married Gwyneth the heiress of all these fair lands given to him by the will of the king to whom by the death of her father she became a ward. Sir William had married Editha the daughter and heiress of the Franklin of Erstwood a cousin and dear friend of the new Countess of Evesham. In neither couple could the marriage at first have been called one of inclination on the part of the ladies, but love came after marriage. Although the knights and barons of the Norman invasion would, no doubt, be considered rude and rough in these days of broadcloth and civilization, yet their manners were gentle and polished by the side of those of the rough though kindly Saxon Franklins, and although the Saxon maids were doubtless as patriotic as their fathers and mothers, yet the female mind is greatly led by gentle manners and courteous address. Thus then, when bidden or forced to give their hands to the Norman knights, they speedily accepted their lot and for the most part grew contented and happy enough. In their changed circumstances, it was pleasanter to ride side by side of their Norman husbands, surrounded by a gay cavalcade to hawk and to hunt, than to discharge the quiet duties of mistress of a Saxon farmhouse. In many cases, of course, their lot was rendered wretched by the violence and brutality of their lords, but in the majority they were well satisfied with their lot and these mixed marriages did more to bring the peoples together and weld them in one than all the laws and decrees of the Norman sovereigns. This had certainly been the case with Editha whose marriage with Sir William had been one of the greatest happiness. She had lost him three years before the story begins, fighting in Normandy, in one of the innumerable wars in which our first Norman kings were constantly involved. On entering the gates of Erstwood, Cuthbert had rushed hastily to the room where his mother was sitting with three or four of her maidens 
engaged in work. I want to speak to you at once, mother, he said. What is it now, my son, said his mother, who was still young and very comely. Waving her hand to the girls, they left her. Mother, he said, when they were alone, I fear me that Sir Walter is about to make a great raid upon the outlaws. Armed men have been coming in all the morning from the castles round, and if it not be not against the Baron de Wortham, that these preparations are intended and methinks it is not. It must be against the landless men. What would you do, Cuthbert? His mother asked anxiously. It will not do for you to be found meddling in these matters. At present, you stand well in the favour of the Earl, who loves you for the sake of his wife to whom you are kin, and of your father, who did him good liegeman's service. But mother, I have many friends in the wood. There is Canute, their chief, your own first cousin, and many of our friends, all good men and true. Though forced by the cruel Norman laws, to refuge in the woods. What would you do again? His mother asked. I would take Ronald, my pony, and ride to warn them of the danger that threatens. You had best go on foot, my son. Doubtless men have been set to see that none of the Saxon homesteads carry the warning to the woods. The distance is not beyond your reach, for you have often wandered there, and on foot you can evade the eye of the watchers. But one thing, my son, you must promise, and that is, that in no case should the Earl and his bands meet with the outlaws, will you take part in any fray or struggle? That will I willingly, mother, he said. I have no cause for offence against the castle or the forest, and my blood and my kin are with both. I would fain save shedding blood in a quarrel like this. I hope that may come when Saxon and Norman may fight side by side and I may be there to see it. A few minutes later, having changed his blue doublet for one of more sober and less noticeable colour, Cuthbert started for the great forest which then stretched to within a mile of Erstwood. In those days, a large part of the country was covered with forest, and the policy of the Normans in preserving these woods for the chase tended to prevent the increase of cultivation. The farms and cultivated lands were all held by Saxons, who although nominally handed over to the nobles, to whom William and his successors had given the fiefs, saw but little of their Norman masters. These stood, indeed, much in the position in which landlords stand to their tenants, payment being made for the most part in produce. At the edge of the wood, the trees grew comparatively far apart, but as Cuthbert proceeded farther into its recesses, 
The trees in the virgin forest stood thick and close together. Here and there, open glades ran across each other, and in these his sharp eye, accustomed to the forest, could often see the stags starting away at the sound of his footsteps. It was a full hour's journey before Cuthbert reached the point for which he was bound. Here in an open space, probably cleared by a storm ages before, and overshadowed by giant trees, was a group of men, all ages and appearances. Some were occupied in stripping the skin off a buck which hung from the bough of one of the trees. Others were roasting portions of another deer. A few sat apart, some talking, others busy in making arrows, while a few lay asleep on the greensward. As Cuthbert entered the clearing, several of the party rose to their feet. Ah, Cuthbert, shouted a man of almost gigantic stature, who appeared to be one of the leaders of the party. What brings you here, lad, so early? You are not wont to visit us till even, when you can lay your crossbow at a stag by moonlight. No, no, cousin Canute, Cuthbert said, thou cannot stay that I have ever broken the forest laws, though I have looked on often and often whilst you have done so. The abater is as bad as the thief, laughed Canute, and if the foresters caught us in the act, I, what they would be, would make but little difference whether it was the shaft of my longbow or the quarrel from thy crossbow which brought down the quarry. But again, lad, why have you come here? For I see by the sweat on your face and by the heaving of your sides that you have run fast and far. I have, Canute. I have not once stopped for breathing since I left Erstwood. I have come to warn you of danger. The Earl is preparing for a raid. Canute laughed somewhat disdainfully. He has raided here before, and I trow has carried off no game. The landless men of the forest can hold their own against a handful of Norman knights and retainers in their own home. I said Cuthbert, but this will be no common raid. This morning bands from all the holds within miles round are riding in and at least 500 men at arms are likely to do chase today. Is it so, said Canute, while exclamations of surprise, but not of apprehension, broke from those standing around. If that be so, lad, you have done us good service indeed. With fair warning, we can slip through the fingers of ten times five hundred men. But if they came upon us unawares and hemmed us in, it would not fare but badly with us, though we should, I doubt not, give a good account of them before their battle axes and maces ended the strife. Have you any idea 
by which road they will enter the forest, or what are their intentions. I know not, Cuthbert said, all that I gathered was the Earl intended to sweep the forest and to put an end to the breaches of the laws, not to say of the rough treatment that his foresters have met with at your hands. You had best, methinks, be off before Sir Walter, and his heavily armed men are here. The forest, large as it is, will scarce hold you both, and methinks you had best shift your quarters to Langham Chase until the storm has passed. To Langham it be then, said Canute, though I do not love the place. Sir John of Wartham is a worse neighbour by far than the Earl. Against the latter we bear no malice. He is a good knight and a fair lord, and could be free himself of the Norman notions that the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fishes of the water all belong to Normans that we Saxons have no share in them. I should have no quarrel with him. He grinds not his neighbours. He is content with a fair tithe of the produce and as between man and man is a fair judge without favour. The baron is a fiend incarnate. Did he not fear that he would lose by doing so? He would gladly cut the throats or burn or drown or hang every Saxon within twenty miles of his hold. He is a disgrace to his order and some day when our band gathers a little stronger we will burn his nest about his ears. It will be a hard nut to crack, Cuthbert said, laughing. With such arms as you have in the forest, the enterprise would be something akin to scaling the skies. Ladders and axes will go far, lad, and the Norman men at arms have learned to dread our shafts. But enough of the Baron. If we must be his neighbours for a time, so be it. That concludes the readings from tonight's episode. If you've enjoyed it, but still want to listen to more, please feel free to listen to one of the episodes. I look forward to bringing you another story soon, and in the meantime, good night. Thank you.